Good evening, everyone. My name is Candice, and I'm an event manager at Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of the rest of the staff and Town Hall and our partners at Third Place Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation with mathematics professor Jason Rosenhaus. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization and a place where we can share <clears throat> and sustain ideas and creativity, even if we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Jason for appearing tonight to help make this possible. Town Hall will continue to produce virtual content this season, including our podcast, In the Moment, which features exclusive guests, and many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include a conversation between Ruth ben Giat and Virginia Heffernan on how to stop authoritarian strong men, Andre Gregory discussing his book about his life in pursuit of art, and Ed Power in conversation with Craig Gordon, taking us on the fascinating exploration for avalanches. Check out more of what's in store on our online calendar at townhallseattle.org. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain due to the ever-changing landscape. We hope you'll consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation or by becoming a member. You can click on the donate button at the bottom of the screen at any time. Our partner booksellers have also been hit by the negative effects of COVID and can use your support as well. We encourage you to support local independent bookstores by purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight. Use the link on this live stream page to purchase through third place books. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing via our YouTube page linked here in the chat. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The video will be available for re-watching immediately following tonight's broadcast. The presentation tonight will be about an hour, including Q&A. We will select questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. We will also take questions from those submitted in the YouTube chat. We can't guarantee we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. So please keep your questions concise and in the form of the question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arno Matulski Science Series is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, Winco Foundation Northwest, and the Taxpayers of Washington. And finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all the members watching tonight. And now for tonight's program. Logic has a reputation for being staid and boring, so how can we explain the popularity of games like Sudoku? which is a logic puzzle masquerading as an amusing recreation. We are joined tonight by mathematics professor Jason Rosenhaus to discuss just this conundrum. Jason is a professor at James Madison University in Virginia. As a kid growing up in New Jersey, Jason was an avid chess player competing in tournaments and attending chess camp. He received his PhD in mathematics from Dartmouth College and has been a contributor to blogs and such publications as the Huffington Post. He is the author of several books, including The Monty Hall Problem, The Remarkable Story of Math's Most Contentious Brain Teaser, published in 2009, and Among the Creationists, Dispatches from the Anti-Evolutionist Frontline in 2012. He's also the editor of Mathematics Magazine, published by the Mathematical Association of America. His books, Games for Your Mind, The History and Future of Logic Puzzles, released just a week ago, is the topic of this evening's talk. Please join me in welcoming Jason Rosenhaus. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much for that very kind introduction. And uh, thanks to uh, all of you for um, uh, joining us tonight. And uh, yeah, let me just take a moment to share my screen here so you can see my slides. And um, there we go. And yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about uh, logic and logic puzzles and why I wrote the book. And uh, hopefully I can uh, convince you that actually logic can be fun <laughs> despite its uh, somewhat boring reputation. Um, but, you know, it's kind of funny thing about logic, uh, you know, th thinking about logic as sort of an academic discipline, uh, because uh, on the one hand, uh, in practical situations, logic never really seems very complicated. Um, you know, for example, uh, if I tell you that all cats are mammals, and then I tell you that all mammals are animals, right, I think you very quickly conclude uh, that therefore all cats are animals, 
Uh, by the way, this particular animal uh, is my cat, Emily, uh, here showing the, uh, the proper function of a shoebox. Uh, so I thought that was cute. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Rene Descartes, uh, he famously said, I think, therefore I am. Okay, now uh, logic cannot tell you whether or not that's true, but logic certainly can tell you that his statement is equivalent to, uh, I'm not, therefore I don't think. Okay, so that's logic for you. And um, uh, as I said, you know, there's this reasoning, you know, never really seems, uh, you know, very complicated, right? Uh, here's a, a quote from uh, John Venn uh, of Venn Diagram fame. Uh, and uh, he wrote uh, in a book, this was uh, like 1880 that he wrote this. He said, uh, it may almost be doubted whether any human being provided he had received a good general education, was ever seriously baffled in any problem, either in conduct or of thought, by what could strictly be called merely a logical difficulty. Do we ever fail to get at a conclusion from sheer inability to see our way through a train of merely logical reasoning? And yeah, and I think there's, a, there's something to that, right? You know, somehow, uh, in, you know, in just day-to-day -day situations where you have to come up with a logically correct uh, you know, solution, it just never really seems all that complicated. I, I mean, just think of it this way, right? Uh, you know, anytime uh, you, know, you misplace your keys uh, and then you look for them by retracing your steps, uh, you're basically using basic logic. You know, you say to yourself, well, uh, I know that I had my keys when I left the house uh, and then I visited locations A, B, and C, and I could only have left the keys at a place that I visited, so I should go check, you know, locations A, B, and C. And, and, and of course, you know, no one ever really stops to, to, to uh, you know, to outline the steps of the argument, uh, but that's precisely my point, right? The basic logic of the situation you process so automatically that, you know, you don't even realize that you've reasoned at all. It just seems kind of obvious. Uh, so that's logic for you. Uh, and yet, you know, you know, that's logic in sort of the day-to-day -day sense. Uh, but if you pick up a textbook in logic, okay, and, and God help you if you do that, um, and you open it to a random page, there's a pretty good chance you're going to see something like this, okay? And uh, you're going to see a lot of like really incomprehensible symbols. And um, it's sure going to look very complicated. This, this particular excerpt here uh, comes from a book called Principia Mathematica, uh, written around uh, 1912, I believe, by uh, Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead. And uh, it's considered one of the great masterpieces of mathematical logic. And um, just, just for the sheer joy of it, you might want to have a look at this and try to figure out what it was that Russell and Whitehead are actually proving here. Uh, if you see that DEM at the top of the page, uh, that stands for demonstration. So they're trying to demonstrate something here. What do you suppose they were actually trying to prove? Um, uh, and uh, I don't want to totally spoil the suspense for you, uh, but uh, just to give you a hint, I will show you verbatim. You know, the very next sentence that appears after this piece of, of text, okay? Again, this is word for word what they say. It says, from this definition, it will follow when arithmetical addition has been defined that one plus one equals two, right? So, uh, yeah, and let me tell you, you know, th this proof appears like hundreds of pages into the book, okay? So, you know, even, you know, even one plus one equals two can be made to look very complicated uh, if you really stop to, you know, uh, to uh, write out every step. Uh, and I guess I should point out, this isn't even a complete proof, right? We have to define arithmetical addition for heaven's sake. Uh, so yeah, so uh, Russell and Whitehead, were, uh, were, were they were kind of into this. Um, and uh, yeah, so you, so you have this dichotomy that uh, on the one hand, logic doesn't really seem all that complicated in day-to-day -day life. And yet mathematical logic, or you know, if you pick up a textbook in logic, uh, it sure looks very complicated indeed. Um, but here's the thing, uh, you know, even people who, who, would, who would want nothing to do uh, you know, with, uh, say, a, you know, a graduate school course in logic or who would never read a textbook on the subject, uh, often find that they like logic uh, when it's presented in the form of a puzzle. And uh, I think, uh, you know, how else do you explain the success of Sudoku uh, puzzles? Uh, here's, a, here's a typical example. Uh, probably most of you have seen a Sudoku puzzle. Uh, just in case you haven't, the basic idea here is that you have a nine by nine grid. And um, uh, in each row, column, and three by three block, you have to place the digits one through nine uh, exactly once. Right. And um, and yeah, and this is this is just a straight up logic puzzle, uh, even though it's not presented that way. Uh, and yet, you know, these puzzles, uh, uh, you know, they, they you know, they appear in uh, you know, in flight magazines and in newspapers and, and, and books of Sudoku puzzles routinely sell well. Uh, and yet it's a logic puzzle. Right. Those initial clues that you're given uh, are, are your starting information and you're trying to deduce the logical consequences of that data. It's a straight up logic puzzle. Uh, and, and, you know, and people, as I said, people tend to enjoy these things. Uh, I could also mention the game uh, Mastermind, which I would imagine a lot of people are uh, familiar with. Uh, here's a, you know, an old image of it that I uh, shamelessly swiped off the internet. Again, just in case you're not familiar with the game, the basic idea is that you have a code maker and a code breaker. So it's two players. And the code maker uh, takes four of those colored pegs 
and, uh, and arranges them in a line. And he does this out of sight of the code breaker. Uh, and that constitutes the code. And uh, the code breaker then gets 10 tries uh, to guess what the code is by, you know, by you know, placing various colored pegs of its own. And after each, uh, after each guess that the code breaker uh, tries, the code maker gives him some information. He says like, okay, you have certain pegs represent the right color in the wrong spot and certain other you know, pegs represent the right color in the right spot. And ultimately you have to deduce you know, what the actual code is. And I got to tell you, this game has um, uh, you know, some very uh, you know, more memories for me uh, because I used to play this with my father when I was quite young. Uh, I was about eight or nine years old when we started playing this. And, um, and you know, for, for me at that age, it was just a little too complicated. Uh, I would try things like I, I would do like four red pegs and then four blue pegs and then four yellow pegs. And, and in that way, I could quickly find out what colors were used. Uh, but then I didn't have enough guesses left to get the right permutation of the pegs. But the reason I have such more memories is that uh, you know, when we reversed it, when my father was the one trying to, you know, when he was the code breaker, uh, he got it every time. And, uh, and, you know, I remember after we would play, uh, he would then go through, he would explain his reasoning to me. And I remember I was like eight or nine years old at the time. And he explained just with crystal clarity, you know, in a way that a child can understand exactly how he reasoned it out. And I remember thinking that, that looks something like a superpower to me. Uh, I, I actually have a very clear memory of thinking, you know, I want to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, years later I can, but, uh, but it took me a while. And, uh, but anyway, uh, this is a perennially uh, you know, best-selling game. And, uh, and yet it's a game of pure logic. I mean, there's no, uh, no, there's nothing flashy about it. So, so there's the dichotomy, right? You have, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, textbook logic, which is kind of dull. Uh, and then you have logic puzzles, which everyone seems to enjoy. Uh, now, uh, so I, I, you know, I, I'm uh, you know, a few minutes into my talk now, and I've uh, said lots of words about logic, but we, we should try to define what logic actually is. And, and actually, uh, uh, you know, many writers have uh, taken on that task. Uh, James Thurber wrote, uh, since it is possible to touch a clock without stopping it, it follows that one can start a clock without touching it. Uh, this is logic as I understand it. And uh, Lewis Carroll, who, who we'll talk quite a bit about as we go along, uh, in, uh, I believe it was Through the Looking Glass, he has his character Tweedledum, Tweedledee say, uh, if it was so, it might be, and if it were so, it would be, but since it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. Uh, Bertrand Russell, logic is the subject in which nobody knows what one is talking about, nor whether what one is saying is true. <laughs> uh, and maybe my favorite one comes from Ambrose Bierce. Uh, this is from his uh, book, uh, The Devil's Dictionary, which is uh, freely available online and well worth a browse where he gives humorous definitions of things. And he says, logic is the art of thinking and reasoning in strict accordance with the limitations and incapacities of the human misunderstanding. It says the base of the basis of logic is the syllogism consisting of a major and a minor premise and a conclusion. Thus, 60 men can do a piece of work 60 times as quickly as one man. One man can dig a post hole in 60 seconds. Therefore, 60 men can dig a post hole in one second. Uh, this may be called the syllogism arithmetical in which by combining logic and mathematics, we obtain a double certainty and are twice blessed. Uh, okay, so uh, you know, not quite the definitions you'll find in the textbooks, uh, but, uh, but perfectly serviceable definitions uh, nonetheless. Now we have one more little item of uh, bookkeeping before we really get into the, uh, the thrust of things. Um, we're gonna refer to some different kinds of logic, different varieties of logic. And uh, I just wanna introduce some terminology right now. Um, we'll sometimes refer to Aristotelian logic, uh, which is basically logic the way Aristotle uh, pioneered it. And, uh, and basically Aristotelian logic is all about so-called categorical syllogisms. And um, basically the simplest example of that is that um, the example that I started with, that all cats are mammals, all mammals are animals, therefore all cats are animals. That's an example uh, of a categorical syllogism. And, uh, and basically, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the formal study of logic was basically uh, about studying these sorts of arguments, these sorts of syllogisms. And uh, you know, the issues can get surprisingly subtle uh, you know, and complex uh, about, um, about these sorts of arguments. And frankly, uh, you know, for, for most of its history, uh, Aristotle really dominated uh, you know, the, the study of logic. Um, on the other hand, we often often talk about uh, you know, uh, propositional logic. And uh, you can view that as an extension of Aristotelian logic that deals with connectives such as and, or, not, and if, then. So a simple example would be if I say like, uh, you know, uh, if P then Q, and then I tell you that P is true, you conclude that Q is true. Uh, okay, that's, a, that's an example of propositional logic. And, um, and we'll also have a reason to refer to a mathematical logic. Okay, now mathematical logic is a little more abstract. Uh, and the idea in mathematical logic is that you're studying questions about truth and provability in formal systems. Um, so, um, 
Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think it's not worth going into what that is, but uh, mathematical logic uh, is uh, you know, like the, the, the big names that you think of are people like George Boole, uh, Gottlieb Frege, uh, and Bertrand Russell. Uh, and that's still a going area of, re of uh, research to this day. Uh, we won't have too much to say about mathematical logic, but it's kind of the, uh, the kind of the third pillar uh, you know, of the subject. Uh, but as I mentioned, logic actually begins with Aristotle. And uh, you know, frankly, most academic disciplines begin with Aristotle. And uh, he wrote uh, a collection of six books uh, that, that are nowadays considered his work in logic. Uh, and those six works together uh, are referred to collectively as the organon, uh, which means the tool, uh, specifically the tool, you know, tool for reasoning. And uh, the, you know, of those six works, the one where he introduced the study of formal logic uh, is called the prior analytics. And I want to show you how he began. This is this is uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, this is this is how he 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 uh, he uh, you know introduced the study of logic. Uh, he wrote, uh, "We must first state the subject of our inquiry and the faculty to which it belongs. Uh, its subject is demonstration, and the faculty that carries it out demonstrative science. We must next define a premise, a term, and a syllogism, and the nature of a perfect and of an imperfect syllogism. And after that, and you know, you, you can read the rest. Uh, so I, somehow that just amuses me because uh, I, I sort of feel like uh, Aristotle uh, not only inaugurated the study of logic, but apparently he inaugurated the tradition that logic textbooks should be extremely boring. Um, let's." Uh, you know, here's a little bit more. A premise then is a sentence affirming or denying one thing of another. This is either universal or particular or indefinite. By universal, I mean the statement uh, that, that something belongs to all or none of something else. And you know, I defy you to read Aristotle and not mentally do that slow, nasally voice. Uh, I, I literally think it's impossible to, you know, to do it. And, uh, and you have to understand, you know, if, if, you, if you really try to read Aristotle's work, it's page after page of this. Uh, I mean, Aristotle was really into it. Um, and uh, he had a tendency to belabor details. Um, see if you can uh, make sense of this. See if you can figure out what Aristotle is proving uh, in this paragraph here, okay? He has a, a specific idea in mind. He says, first then, uh, take a universal negative with the terms A and B. If no B is A, neither can any A be B. For if some A, say C, were B, it would not be true that no B is A, for C is a B. But if every B is A, then some A is B. For if no A were B, then no B could be A. But we assume that every B is A. Uh, here's another paragraph of a similar sort. Basically, what, what he's actually doing there uh, is he's explaining that a statement of the form no, uh, no A's are B's uh, is logically equivalent to the statement no B's are A's. Like if I say something like uh, no cats are fish, right? That's actually logically equivalent to no fish are cats. Either one of those statements implies the other. And, and that's all he's actually doing there. And, uh, and when you put it that way, uh, it really seems kind of obvious. I mean, it's really just like, you feel like it's just a matter of understanding the language. Like if you speak the language, you understand that that's two ways of saying the same thing. But I, I always like to wonder, um, you know, suppose I didn't know that, okay? W would, would this proof convince anyone, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, like like has prose such as this ever convinced anyone who, wa who wasn't clear on the idea that no A's or B is the same thing as no B's or A? Uh, the second paragraph here does the same thing for the statement some A's or B versus some, B excuse me, uh, some B's or A. So yeah, so I mean, that's Aristotle for you. And um, uh, as I said, it's page after page of this. Uh, now I should mention that uh, you know, the prior analytics was only one of his six books in logic. Uh, he had five others and these five, you know, excuse me, these six works all together. Um, he sort of considered it a, like a, a comprehensive treatise on the entirety of human reasoning. In other words, it wasn't just formal logic that he was interested in. Uh, he was also interested in how you define words and drawing distinctions between objects. And, um, uh, and uh, this will become relevant later, that that's kind of how Aristotle heard it, but uh, uh, Aristotle viewed things. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, you know the hi history has not always been so kind uh, to Aristotle. Uh, here's Bertrand Russell, of course, one of the giants of uh, you know, 20th century logic. Uh, I guess uh, he started in the 19th century. Uh, this came, comes from his book, uh, The History of Western Philosophy. This was his verdict on Aristotle's work. Uh, he said, uh, I conclude that the Aristotelian doctrines with which we have been concerned in this chapter are wholly false, with the exception of the formal theory of the syllogism, which is unimportant. Any person in the present day who wishes to learn logic will be wasting his time if he reads Aristotle or any of his disciples. Throughout modern times, practically every advance in science and logic or in philosophy has had to be made in the teeth of the opposition from Aristotle's uh, disciples. Yeah, uh, so I mean, Russell could be a little bit caustic. Uh, you, should, you should see what he said about Euclid, for heaven's sake. Uh, pretty nasty. Um, but uh, it's kind of interesting, right? Because Aristotle, as I said, has this kind of weird position in the, you know, in the history of Western thought uh, in that on the one hand, if you compare him to anything that came before, uh, he was a massive step forward. I mean, he, he was working at a much higher level than just about any, anyone else at his time. And, and he wrote, you know, with great scholarly seriousness, 
uh, on uh, you know just almost any academic subject you can think of. You know, philosophy, and metaphysics, and uh, you know, um, uh, and physics, and, and biology, and politics, and rhetoric. And uh, you know, his collected works uh, amount to you know a few thousand pages. And uh, and that's only a fraction of his total output because uh, we know from references and other writing that a lot of his work has not survived to the present. So on the one end, he's very impressive. Uh, but on the other end, a lot of his big ideas just haven't fared very well today. And especially in philosophy, um, uh, you know, he's, he's considered a little bit of a punchline that most of his uh, ideas just have not held up very well. Um, but Aristotle had this outsized, uh, uh, you know, outsized role in the history of Western philosophy, uh, precisely because uh, the Roman Catholic Church adopted many aspects of his philosophy into their catechism. And, uh, and that, that, that's what Russell was referring to when he says that, uh, you know, everything had to be made in the teeth of the opposition for Aristotle's disciples. So anyway, that's Aristotle for you. And, um, but uh, perhaps, uh, you know, because Aristotelian logic, uh, you know, dominated, um, uh, actually, let me go back for a second, actually uh, dominated the study of uh, logic for so long, uh, you know, this led to, uh, you know, say, uh, you know, medieval logic, uh, you know, all through the medieval period, uh, where there was a kind of a resurgence of interest in logic and, and people started producing very, uh, you know, difficult, dense tomes. Uh, named, some of the big names are people like uh, Peter Abelard uh, or William of Ockham. Uh, you've probably heard of Occam's Razor, uh, you know, that William of Occam. And they wrote these very big, dense tomes that combined, uh, you know, logic uh, and the philosophy of language. And, uh, and you can find these books, uh, you know, collecting dust in some of the darker corners uh, of the university's libraries. And um, uh, they, you know, they don't make for exciting reading, I got to tell you. I, I, I explore, you know, in, in the book, I actually have a short section uh, uh, describing some of their main ideas. Uh, but anyway, this led to something of a revolt in the 1600s. This is John Milton, uh, better known from uh, Paradise Lost. Uh, in an essay about education, he said, uh, universities present their young, unmatriculated novices at first coming with the most intellective abstractions of logic and metaphysics and skipping ahead a little bit. Uh, they do, for the most part, grow into hatred and contempt of learning, mocked and deluded all this while with ragged notions and babblements while they expected worthy, delightful knowledge. Now, I got to tell you, uh, you know, people don't write like this anymore. And uh, I think the, uh, the the old English spellings here uh, really make the sarcasm all the more biting. And I don't know about you, but that the, the word babblement, uh, you know, that is a word that should never have left the English language. Uh, that is that is just a perfect word. Uh, somehow, uh, you know, I think of that word every time I watch the news nowadays. Uh, so babblement is definitely a keeper. Um, and uh, yeah, here's um, here's a, this is from a textbook written around the same time, also in the 1600s. Uh, it's usually called the Port the the, uh, the Port Royal Logic. This was actually a logic textbook, and uh, the authors write. Uh, this is what the philosophers have specially undertaken to accomplish and in relation to which they have made such magnificent promises. If we may believe them, they will furnish us in that part which is devoted to this purpose and which they call logic with a light capable of dispelling all the darkness of the mind. They correct all the errors of our thoughts and they give us rules so sure that they conduct us infallibly to the truth so necessary that without them it is impossible to know anything with complete certainty. These are the praises which they have themselves bestowed on their precepts. But if we consider what experience shows us of the use which these philosophers make of them, both in logic and in other parts of philosophy, we shall have good grounds to suspect the truth of their promises. So yeah, so a little bit of a, some, some pushback against Aristotelian logic. And uh, if you understand all of this background, uh, if you understand, you know, if you really spend some time communing with Aristotle or with medieval logic or with any of the textbooks being produced uh, you know, uh, throughout these centuries, the idea that recreational logic could be a thing that we could do logic just for fun. Uh, that uh, that took a, a very creative intellect, and it fell to Lewis Carroll uh, to to, um, uh, uh, to 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 do that to kind of put recreational logic on the map. Now, uh, Lewis Carroll, of course, is more famous as the author of Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. But I suspect most of you know, right? Lewis Carroll was a pen name that he used. Uh, his real name was Charles Dodson. And uh, as Dodson, he was a you know a very uh, uh, you know a uh, you know, fairly well known mathematician, uh, you know very a very competent, a very serious guy, made fundamental contributions in uh, algebra and voting theory. Uh, and you know he you know, he he probably wouldn't be listed among the great mathematicians of all time, but he was certainly a very competent and serious fellow. And uh, there, there's a there's a, a famous anecdote uh, about him. Uh, it's probably apocryphal, but it's such a good story that it really should be true. Uh, where, uh, you know, of course, he was known, uh, he, you know, he wrote Alice in Wonderland through the Looking Glass. These became very successful books. And uh, the story goes that some very uh, you know, prominent person of the time said to him, oh, uh, Mr. Carroll, I enjoyed uh, you know, your book so much. Uh, would you mind sending me a copy of your next book? Which Carroll happily did. His next book was Introduction to the Theory of Determinants. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, there you go. You know, he had kind of this dual life. Now, it's interesting. Uh, his work in logic, he published under the Lewis Carroll name. Uh, and in around 1880, he published this book, uh, The Game of Logic, and it was uh, based on uh, Aristotelian logic. And uh, it's kind of funny, right? Because um, 
Uh, basically, what he what Carroll actually does in the game of logic is that he takes the basic principles of categorical syllogisms, Aristotelian logic, and he presents them in a for, uh, in the form of a game, uh, specifically directed at kids. And uh, I, I just find that hilarious because because uh, where Aristotle saw you know a complete and comprehensive treatise of the entirety of human reasoning, uh, Lewis Carroll saw a game suitable for children. And uh, I like that. So let me show you the game. Okay, here 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 is the game. Uh, the game is he gives you two categorical statements, uh, and then you have to deduce the consequences. And uh, and his statements were always very humorous. Uh, so here's here's an example he himself used. Uh, if I say no nice cakes are unwholesome, and then I say some new cakes are unwholesome, what would you conclude? And uh, and if you have some flair for this, uh, you know maybe maybe you can just come up with a conclusion pretty quickly. But I don't I don't know that it's actually so easy to do. So the funny thing is, uh, Carol had a specific method in mind. Uh, for how to do this, okay? He didn't just throw the kids to the wolves and say, deduce away. No, he had a specific formal procedure. And um, uh, yeah, and the, the basic idea here uh, is that he wanted to use a special kind of Venn diagram, and I'll come to that in a moment. I should point out, though, that when we talk about uh, trying to find a solution to the puzzle, you should notice, right, that the, um, the, the, the predicate wholesomeness appears in both statements. So the idea is to come up with a statement that relates nice cakes to new cakes. Okay, so that's our goal. That's how we know when we win. You know, if no nice cakes are unwholesome and some new cakes are unwholesome, what does that, you know, how does that relate nice cakes to new cakes? And, uh, okay, so anyway, uh, Carol's method involved drawing a diagram like this. Now, uh, you're probably used to, see, you know, thinking of Venn diagrams being drawn with circles. Uh, that's, that's the usual way it's done. But, of course, there's no reason why it has to be circles. And um, uh, Carol, for various reasons, preferred to use rectangles. Uh, he, uh, he actually discusses in great detail his reasons for choosing rectangles uh, over circles in the book. And uh, the basic idea here is that we have three um, three predicates, is the fancy name, three characteristics that cakes might have. They might either be nice or not nice, new or not new, and wholesome or, or, or unwholesome. And the idea here is that X will represent niceness. So anything above the center horizontal line represents being nice, and then the X prime there means being not nice. So nice things are in the top half, not nice things are in the bottom half. Uh, y will represent newness, so things on the left half represent new things, and things on the right half uh, represent uh, not new things. And then wholesomeness is represented by being inside or outside the inner square there. Okay, so you know, um, uh, wholesome things are inside the little square, and unwholesome things are outside. Notice, by the way, that we use the letter M uh, for what we call the middle term, the wholesomeness, the term that appears in both uh, statements. Okay, so if I now say no nice cakes are unwholesome, okay, well, nice cakes reside above the line, above the, the center horizontal line, okay? Uh, yeah, nice cakes reside there. Uh, unwholesome cakes uh, are outside the small square. So if there were any nice cakes that were unwholesome, they would be found in regions five and six here. But since we're told there are none, we'll use a gray counter to, enter into, uh, to represent that fact, okay? So those two gray counters represent the premise, no nice cakes are unwholesome. But then we're told that some new cakes are unwholesome. Well, new cakes are on the left side of the diagram. Um, unwholesome cakes, again, are, you know, are outside the small square. So if so, any, uh, any new unwholesome cakes would have to appear in either region five or region seven. We already know that region five is empty. So we put a red counter in, seasons, uh, is, excuse me, in region seven uh, to indicate that there is something there. Okay, so this is sort of a pictorial representation of the two premises. And now the idea was uh, you take this diagram with three terms uh, and you transfer it to one that omits the middle term, right? And since we know, right, you know, uh, we know that there is something in these two regions here, we can transfer it to here, uh, and uh, and then we get our conclusion. Uh, in this case, uh, in this case, uh, you know, some new cakes are not nice. In other words, you know, this region uh, represents, uh, you know, new cakes y that are not nice x prime, and there is something there. So some new cakes are not nice. Okay, and that, in a nutshell, is the game. And uh, there, there are a lot of details and a lot of nuances about how you represent uh, different premises, uh, you know, using these counters. And Carol is very humorous uh, about uh, describing it. Uh, you know, Carol, nothing else. He was a very good writer, and uh, you know, you know, he can make this presentation seem very interesting. Uh, now, in his book, he has about uh, I don't know fifty or so of these, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, categorical puzzles to solve. Uh, in a subsequent book called Symbolic Logic, uh, he he uh, he tries more complicated ones. <clears throat> so once you've tried puzzles with two categorical premises, uh, you know, you might as well try three, four or more, right? Like, like once you've done Frankenstein, you have to do Bride of Frankenstein is how it works, right? So, uh, so here we go. Here's a puzzle for you. See what you conclude from the following statements. Uh, all the policemen on this beat sup with our cook. No man with long hair can fail to be a poet. 
Amos Judd has never been in prison. Our cook's cousins all love cold mutton. None but policemen on this beat are poets. Uh, none but her cousins ever sup with our cook. And men with short hair have all been in prison. Okay, so go for it. What do you conclude from all of that? And um, let's see, if we look for the singletons, if we look for the, you know, the predicates that only appear once each, it looks like it's Amos Judd and something about cold mutton. And if you care to work your way through it, and who wouldn't care to work your way through it, you come up with Amos Judd loves cold mutton. Uh, okay, so uh, you know Carroll was really into this. And, and his book, Symbolic Logic, he has puzzles with 40 to 50 categorical premises. And I got to tell you, uh, as much as I enjoy logic puzzles, uh, I didn't want, uh, you know, I didn't even want to transcribe those puzzles, much less try to solve them myself. But, but for all of that, uh, Carroll actually had a serious point to make with all of this. This wasn't just recreational. Okay. He, he intended his work in logic to also represent a serious contribution to the scholarship of his time. And, uh, and this puzzle relates to actually a serious question, uh, that, 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 uh, you know, philosophers were asking, which is that if you have a collection of categorical statements, Okay, could you, you know, could you come up with a formal procedure for deducing what follows from them? And Carroll had some very interesting and innovative things to say about that. And uh, you know, basically, he would take these statements, he would translate them into a symbolic language, uh, and then by uh, you know, uh, you know, carrying out certain uh, algorithms, uh, you know, he would come up with the answer, at least in certain cases. And it was all very clever and very nice. And um, uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, yeah, that, that, you know, and essentially, I, I guess I should point out before we move on, right? Uh, remember his, his work in logic, he published under the Lewis Carroll name, not under the Charles Dodson name. So even though, you know, it, you know, even though he intended, uh, for this to be uh, recreational and fun and, and, and pedagogical, uh, he also intended it to be serious scholarly, uh, work. Uh, and this is one of the themes of my book actually, which is that, you know, um, uh, I found it very difficult as I were, as I did my research. Uh, to distinguish when was I doing recreational mathematics just for fun, and when was I addressing you know serious questions that uh, that scholars were asking. Anyway, uh, returning now to the game of logic, uh, I got to tell you when I read the, the book, I, I thought it was really fun. Uh, I um, uh, I made a little uh, you know uh, you know the, the, you know, the three way diagram and the two way diagram, and uh, I got some pennies and nickels to use as counters, and I worked through about a dozen of the puzzles uh, in Carroll's book. And, uh, and I, I thought it was really fun. I, I thought it was really clever how just by moving these counters around on a little piece of paper, uh, you know, the solution to these puzzles would just sort of appear, you know, just by magic. I thought that was great. But, you know, it's an occupational hazard uh, for mathematicians both to overestimate how, how much fun our subject is and to underestimate how much trouble other people have with it. So I do feel in, this, in, the, uh, in the interest of giving equal time to the other side, uh, I do feel compelled to uh, uh, show you an actual review. This is the entire review uh, it, would, it was appeared uh, in the um, uh, a journal called uh, a Literary World, I believe it was called. And um, uh, yeah, here we go. This is an unsigned article. Oh, I, I should mention, actually, before we come to that, uh, there's a reference in this review uh, to a character named Dr. Blimer. And um, uh, this is a character from Charles Dickens' novel, A Dombey and Son. And uh, I, think, uh, I think you'll be able to infer what kind of person he is uh, from the way he's referred to here. So we confess to having spent some minutes in trying to make out just how children are to be persuaded to enjoy Mr. Lewis Carroll's new book, The Game of Logic, with his accompanying diagrams and red and gray wafers. There may be young people capable of being amused by such syllogisms as no old rabbits are greedy, some not greedy rabbits are black, all white rabbits are free from greediness, and by disposing X and Y, predicates, attributes, major and minor premises in order do, with a red wafer here and two gray wafers there, but we should be at a loss where to lay our hands upon such young people outside of the establishment of the late well-known Dr. Blimer. We seem to see some pale little Dombey Jr. bending a puzzled brow over the book and trying to convince himself that it is fun in a game and not hard work under a thin disguise, but a sturdy boy, not of the little Paul order and not educated by Dr. Blimer, would, we are inclined to think, spurn the game of logic as a stupid sham. Black rabbits, greedy rabbits, pink pigs and all, and clamor for some play that is really play, or else some study that is really study, on the principle that two things, each good in itself, often make when mixed a third thing, which is neither good nor desirable. Okay, well, I think that's a little harsh, but I uh, but I like a good hatchet job as much as the next person, so I appreciate the uh, the lively writing. Uh, okay, uh, let's move on. Um, uh, in, in the 1930s, uh, philosopher Nelson Goodman uh, published a different sort of logic puzzle. Uh, it featured nobles and hunters, and the idea is that nobles only make true statements while hunters only make false statements. And he asks us to imagine that uh, we're on this uh, island where the nobles and the hunters live, and we meet three people. Uh, and uh, we ask the first one, are you a noble or are you a hunter? And the first person kind of mumbles something. We, we, we can't make out what he said. So we ask the second person uh, what the first person said. <laughs> and the second person replies, oh, he said he was a hunter. 
And then the third person chimes in and says, don't believe him. He's a hunter. Uh, and then the question is, what can you conclude about the three people? And, and just in the interest of being completely historically accurate, I should point out, this is not exactly Nelson Goodman's puzzle. Uh, it's a slightly simplified version of his puzzle that I think makes the, uh, the issues involved a little bit clearer. Okay, so anyway, that's the situation. Uh, you know, uh, the first person mumbles his reply. The second person said, oh, the first person said he was a hunter. But then the third person says, no, don't believe the second person. He is, he really is a hunter. And the question is, what can you conclude? And, uh, you know, if you've never done one of these before, maybe it's not so clear uh, how to start. But the key observation uh, is that in this situation, nobody can ever claim to be a hunter. Okay. And uh, let's, uh, let's see why that is. Uh, if a hunter said, I am a hunter, right, he would be telling the truth, right? If a hunter said, I'm a hunter, he's telling the truth. But hunters don't make true statements. Okay, so this scenario is impossible. And uh, if, if a noble said, I'm a hunter, well, that noble would be lying, right? He's, he's not a hunter, okay? But, but nobles can't lie, right? Nobles only tell the truth. So that's also impossible. So the point is nobody on this island could ever claim to be a hunter. And that means that the second man was lying when he said what the first man said, right? The second man said, uh, oh, the first guy said he was a hunter, but there is no way the first guy said that. OK, so therefore, uh, the second person is, is definitely a hunter because he was lying. Uh, and then the third person was clearly telling the truth. Uh, in this particular version of the puzzle, uh, we can't deduce anything about the first person. Um, and uh, there we go. And that's very nice. And I, 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 I you know, th that's um, uh, one of the older examples of a liar and truth teller puzzle. Uh, I, I doubt it's the first, uh, I, I doubt it's the oldest one. I think those puzzles, you know, puzzles of this sort have a very long history, uh, but it's a very well-known one. And uh, puzzles of this sort about liars and truth tellers um, were kind of uh, elevated to a high art uh, by Raymond Smullyan. Uh, he referred to knights and knaves with knights always telling the truth and knaves always lying. And here's a, here's a fun little example. Uh, you meet two people, okay? One of them says, uh, at least one of us is a knave. Okay, what can you conclude? Okay, so again, you meet two people and one of them says, at least one of us is a knave. Okay, so what can we conclude from this? Uh, well, let's see. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I guess there are two possibilities, right? The speaker could be a knave or the speaker could be a knight. Uh, let's just suppose, just to see what happens, that the speaker is a knave. Well, if the speaker is a knave, then his statement, then, you know, I'm sorry, if the speaker is a knave, then there really is at least one knave among them, which implies that the statement that he made really is true, okay? Right, his statement was, uh, at least one of us is a knave, right? And if he's a knave, then it's actually true. So this scenario is impossible. The person who said, at least one of us is a knave, cannot himself be a knave, okay? So therefore, the speaker's a knight. Okay, but if he's a knight, his statement must be true. Okay, so if he's a knight and there's at least one Megan, at least one knave among them, then it must be that the other person is a knave. Okay, so it, so the solution is the speaker is a knight and the other person is a knave. And uh, yeah, let's do one more example of this just to illustrate the genre. Uh, this time you meet three people. I'll call them Anna, Beth, and Carl. And uh, Anna says exactly one of us is a knave. Uh, Beth says exactly two of us are knaves. Uh, and Carl says, all of us are knaves. And then, as always, the question is, what can we conclude? And um, I think the tricky part of a puzzle like this, you always need to, you need, you need a way in, right? And um, uh, and I think uh, Carl's statement should kind of jump out at you at this point. Uh, and, uh, yeah, um, you, know, you know, if Carl is a knight, you know, he certainly could not claim that all of them are knaves. Right, because if he's a knight, they're not all knaves. Okay, so if he's a knight, Carl's statement would be false, and this is a contradiction. Okay, so therefore, Carl is himself a knave, and it must be false that all of them are knaves. Okay, now let's look at Anna and Beth. But Anna and Beth, uh, you know, contradict each other, right? I mean, they can't both be telling the truth, right? Remember, Anna said exactly one of us is a knave. Beth said exactly two of us are knaves, uh, and we know now that one of those statements is true, uh, and one of those statements is false. And what that means uh, is that uh, there really are exactly two knaves among them, okay? So the solution is that Anna and Carl are knaves uh, while Beth is a knight. Uh, okay, and uh, yeah, um, so um, uh, yeah. So anyway, those were just a couple of uh, relatively simple examples to illustrate this, but Smolian's puzzles get enormously complicated. And you know, you know, you know, he has one with multiple speakers and uh, you know, they can get very complicated. And interestingly, just like Lewis Carroll, uh, use logic puzzles to teach people basic techniques of Aristotelian logic, so too did Raymond Smullyan use knights and knaves to illustrate very difficult ideas both in propositional logic and also mathematical logic. So he, you know, he illustrates uh, Goodall's famous theorems for people who might, maybe, uh, you know, might be familiar with those uh, results. Uh, he, he devised series of knights and, you know, puzzles about knights and knaves that get at the main ideas of these theorems. 
And uh, this is another interesting thing I found when I was writing the book, uh, writing the book, excuse me, uh, that, um, uh, you know, you had on the one hand Aristotelian logic. Uh, that basically, what I found when writing the book was that the, the history of logic puzzles recapitulates the history of logic. So like Aristotelian logic was, uh, you know, dominated logic for most of its history. And then Lewis Carroll used his puzzles, not just for recreation, but also to illuminate subtle issues in, these, uh, in this area. And then uh, Raymond Smolian did the same thing with propositional and, uh, and mathematical logic. And that's what I view as the history of logic puzzles. Uh, for the future of logic puzzles, uh, we should say, well, nowadays, uh, it's pretty common to speak of non-classical logics. And that word logics, plural, uh, that probably, if you're, if you're not familiar with this sort of stuff, that has a weird ring to it. Because if there's one thing everyone knows, it's that logic is logic, okay? And that is all there is to it. And the idea that you need an adjective to describe what kind of logic you're doing, or that logic could be plural, just seems bizarre. And let me tell you, the, uh, the spell checker on my computer insists that logics, plural, is not a word. Uh, and yet, uh, that's, it's pretty common nowadays that uh, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, researchers will tend to view systems of logic uh, as being sort of like systems of geometry, right? Like it used to be in mathematics that Euclidean geometry, the kind of geometry you learned in high school, that, that that was just the one true geometry. That's just a true description of how the world is, okay? And that's the way it was viewed. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you could talk about non-Euclidean geometry as sort of, a, you know, an intellectual pastime or something. But, uh, you know, even if such a thing were coherent, uh, it couldn't possibly be useful for anything. Uh, that was the view for, for most, of, most of history. Um, but of course, nobody views it that way today. Uh, you know, nowadays, uh, the universe as a whole uh, is known not to be Euclidean. Uh, Einstein, for example, used non-Euclidean geometry in formulating his theory of relativity. And, and nowadays, the idea is just that there are different systems of geometry and uh, different systems are useful in different contexts. Uh, and that's all there is to it. And increasingly, people view logic that way, uh, that there are just different systems of logic and, um, uh, and different systems might be useful in different contexts. Um, so for example, there are systems of logic that allow multiple truth values, not just true and false. Maybe you want to allow neutral or neither true nor false. Uh, you know, maybe that captures something important. Uh, even basic principles like the law, law of the excluded middle or the law of non-contradiction. Well, you know, you know, uh, you know, people argue about them. Uh, you know, they, they seem so obvious and natural, but, but maybe not. And, uh, and these sorts of systems of logic do find applications, uh, particularly in data science, where you have this problem that computers increasingly have to deal uh, with very large data sets and the data in those data sets might be uh, contradictory in some way. Uh, and you don't want the computers to crash uh, when they, uh, when they uh, address such things. Um, and uh, so uh, my, my uh, you know, if I made an original contribution here, uh, it's that I devised some puzzles in the book based on non-classical logics to try to illustrate some of the main ideas, uh, kind of paralleling what Carol and Smolian did. And um, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure uh, for, for um, you know, uh, people listening to this of a certain age, uh, you might remember the original uh, Star Trek series, uh, talking about Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock. And there was that famous episode where they're imprisoned on a planet by these androids. And um, uh, the androids are always perfectly logical. And uh, if you remember um, uh, the way uh, you know, Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock eventually uh, defeat the aliens is that they, or excuse me, defeat the androids uh, is by uh, confronting them with so many instances of paradoxes and, uh, and, and, and logical uh, inconsistencies uh, that the, the androids just start uh, smoking at the head and they burn out. Uh, we don't want our computers doing that. Uh, so, uh, so maybe non-classical logic is a thing. Uh, okay, uh, let me, uh, I'm starting to run out of time. So let me just show you um, uh, this, this one uh, very famous puzzle. I would feel bad if I um, uh, you know, uh, wrapped up my, uh, my talk on uh, logic puzzles without mentioning an especially famous one. Uh, so imagine you're in a room with two doors. Uh, one leads to heaven and the other leads to hell because we like to be very dramatic in our puzzles. Uh, there are two guards, one of whom always uh, tells the truth and the other always lies. But of course, we don't know which is which. Uh, we can ask one question of one of the guards, uh, after which we must make a choice. Uh, we will, of course, assume that you want the door that leads to heaven. And the question is, what should you ask? Uh, this is a very famous puzzle. Uh, it came up in an old movie called Labyrinth, uh, um, you know, um, a Jim Henson movie uh, starring uh, Jennifer Connelly. Uh, but um, uh, anyway, it's a very famous puzzle. But if you've never seen it before, it really looks impossible. Uh, because, because you know, what could you possibly ask <laughs> one of these guards uh, to figure out what um, uh, you know? You know, you, you could ask. You could, you could go up to one of the guards and say, uh, you know, you know, hey, is this the door to heaven? And and the guard will answer, but you don't know if he's telling the truth or lying. Okay, and no fair guessing, right? You want to be sure. Um, but it turns out it really can be done. And uh, the question you need to ask is: you go up to one of the guards and you say, uh, which door would the other guard say is the door to heaven? Uh, okay. And uh, suppose you're addressing the truth teller. Well, the truth teller knows that the liar would point to the wrong door. 
So the truth teller will truthfully report that. He will truthfully point to the door the liar would point to, and that will be the wrong door. So if you're addressing the truth teller, right, then the, then the truth teller will point to the door to hell. Okay. But the liar, on for his part, knows that the truth teller would point to the right door, but then the liar will lie about it. Okay. So in other words, the truth teller would point to the correct door. Uh, the liar knows that the truth teller would point to the correct door, but he's going to lie and point to the wrong door. So do you see the point? Right. Regardless of which person you ask, right, the, the person you ask will point to the wrong door. They'll point to the door to hell. So pick the other one. And uh, I showed you that puzzle partly because it's really clever and partly because I wanted to show you this cartoon. And I apologize uh, for the low resolution here. I, I grabbed this off the Internet. This is from XKCD. Uh, and he says, uh, and over there we have the labyrinth guards. One always lies. One always tells the truth. And one stabs people who ask tricky questions. So I really like that. Uh, okay, I think I'll, I'll skip over. I was going to do one more puzzle, but I, I'm, I'm getting low on time. So I'll skip over that. And uh, uh, let me just wrap this up. Um, you know, the, the, um, uh, you know, one, one of the themes of the book and the themes of this talk is that you know, logic has this dual existence, that on the one hand, textbook logic tends to be pretty boring, but, but people tend to enjoy logic puzzles. And I can think of no better way uh, of making that point than by, by noting that there's a whole genre of literature uh, devoted to the idea that logic is fun. And, and what I'm talking to is the so-called classical detective story, uh, where you have characters like Sherlock Holmes uh, or Hercule Poirot or Ellery Queen uh, or your numerous other uh, you know, fictional characters I, I could mention. And you know, these are characters where their defining feature is their ability to reason perfectly. Uh, you know, that they, they're just you know, it, it's almost like they're superheroes and their superpower is an ability to remember everything they see and to reason uh, faultlessly from it. And, uh, and, and, you know, these novels, uh, you know, by, by people like Arthur Conan Doyle and Agatha Christie and Ellery Queen. Ellery Queen is both the character and the author for uh, readers, who, for, for people who know about these uh, sorts of things, or John Dixon Carr, uh, or any of these famous writers, Dorothy Sayers. Um, it, there's just something so satisfying uh, about uh, seeing logic wielded as a weapon in the fight against evil. And, you know, um, uh, you, know, the, you know, the English professors uh, among us tend to sneer uh, at literature like this. And, uh, and it has to be admitted, uh, they do have a point. Uh, you know, in other words, these are not novels that you read, you know, because, uh, you know, they're not novels that you read for the, uh, you know, the penetrating social commentary or the richly drawn characters or the, or the plausible dialogue or anything like that. But in a way, the, you know, the very deficiencies of these books as literature uh, and yet their continued success uh, really makes my point because the one redeeming feature of these sorts of stories is that scene at the end where the detective uh, you know, explains his meticulous logic of how he identified the guilty person. And that final scene, at least in the best you know, representatives of the genre, are always so satisfying uh, that uh, it makes up for all the other faults. And um, uh, I've been reading stories like this since I was a kid. And uh, partly uh, I, the, the final chapter in the book is uh, sort of my own little history of the genre. And uh, partly it was just uh, I have spent uh, so much time reading books of this sort that, by God, I wanted to get some professional benefit out of it. But the reason I bring it up now is that I want to close with one last quote. And um, this comes from a, a pas this comes from a short story uh, called uh, The Problem of Cell 13 uh, by Jacques Futrell. Uh, who was a, a journalist, actually, but he had a sideline writing detective stories. Uh, he was American, despite the French-sounding name. Uh, Futrell, uh, in 1912, uh, yeah, he died in 1912. Uh, he went down with the Titanic. Uh, he was on the Titanic and, and drowned. Uh, and, uh, but he published this one transcendently brilliant story uh, called The Problem of Cell 13. His, his detective character was nicknamed The Thinking Machine. Uh, his real name was Professor SFX Van Dusen. And uh, he was a professor of logic. And I do just need to quickly set up this quote. Uh, the plot of the story here was that the thinking machine makes a bet uh, with some academic friends of his. A and the bet is this. He says to them, uh, he says, lock me in any cell, in any prison, anywhere, at any time, wearing only what's necessary, and I'll escape in a week. Okay, That's the bet that he makes. And this is the result of an academic discussion where he's uh, kind of boasting that the mind can solve any problem. There's no problem that the mind can't solve. And, um, and his friends challenge him, says, well, you know, that's all well and good, but you couldn't think your way out of a prison cell. And that's when uh, the thinking machine makes his bet. So one more time, it was lock me in any cell, in any prison, anywhere, at any time, wearing only what's necessary and I'll escape in a week. And in this context, I really don't think it counts as a spoiler if I tell you that the thinking machine does, in fact, make his escape. And that's when this patch of dialogue uh, appears. Uh, so he says, uh, you know, how did you do it? Demanded the warden. Uh, you gentlemen have an engagement to supper with me at half past nine, said the thinking machine. But how did you do it? Insisted the warden. And then he says, don't ever think you can hold any man who can use his brain. 
And I just love that. I read this. I, I, I think I was in like seventh grade when I, when I read this. My father showed me this story. And, you know, here I was kind of this nerdy kid, uh, you know, suffering the fate that uh, middle school nerds often suffer. And, uh, you know, I was much more interested in playing chess and learning math uh, than I was in sports or whatever everyone else was interested in. And to read that, you know, don't ever think you can hold any man who uses brain. To make an ability to reason clearly seem so cool and so sexy. Uh, this was quite a cree to occur. And because uh, I got to tell you, when you read this story, uh, it really seems hopeless. I mean, what's he going to do <laughs> to get out of the cell? And um, uh, but to be that confident in his reasoning ability, you know what? Uh, it makes me rethink what I said before. This is great literature. OK, I go back and reread the story pretty, uh, you, know, you know, periodically. Uh, I just love that. Don't ever think you any man who uses his brain uh, with apologies for the casual sexism. This was written in 1905, of course. Um, Okay, so I think I'll wrap it up there. Uh, if, if any of this was remotely interesting to you, well, I know a good book you can read. And um, uh, you know, the book's available from uh, booksellers uh, everywhere. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed the talk. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. And thanks to all of you for uh, stopping by. And, uh, and that's it for me. So thank you very much. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Jason. <laughs> that is fascinating. I have to say that my brain does not work as fast as yours does, yours does clearly. Uh, a lot of that for me is like, oh, I really got to think through it. Um, I want to invite anyone in the audience who has a question to submit them now. Uh, we're going to take them on YouTube as well. So if you're watching over there, you can just throw them into the chat. Um, at the end, when you were talking about the, the, the books, the, the literature that kind of has these nice tie-ups at the end, I don't read a lot of those, but I read a book over the summer that was very popular, Where the Crawdads Sing, and probably some people in the audience have read it. And one of the reasons it was so satisfying was because it ended in this very nicely tied up plot. And that is so, that is so satisfying. And I yeah. think that's I, I, why that was such a popular book. Can, can, can you say one more time, what was the title of the book? Where the Crawdads Sing. Okay, I, I don't know that one. I'll have, have to add it to the list. Yeah, well, it's not it's not exactly in that genre, I would say, but it's it is kind of like a murder mystery, and uh, and it does like con conclude with all of these like, you know, loose strings all tied up nicely. Um, the other thing that I thought of uh, while listening to your talk was that maybe one of the reasons why people enjoy these puzzles so much is because it gives them this sense of really figuring something out and like really feeling like they're smart for, for a moment, you know? I yeah. wonder if that's a part of it. Yeah, well, I, I think that's true in Sudoku, right? That, that you know, anyone who's worked out a Sudoku puzzle, uh, you, you know, just how satisfying it is when you fill in a cell, right? You, know, you figure out, uh, you know, you say, okay, there's a you know, one, two, three in the row and a four, five, six in the column and a seven, eight in the box. Ah, so it has to be a nine. And, um, uh, you just, you, it makes you feel good. I mean, it's, it's the most pointless thing, right? I and mean, you, you, you know, uh, you know in, the scheme, in the scheme of things, you haven't really accomplished very much. And yet it feels just really good, you know, to, to do it. Right. It's like a great way to, to, to start your day and to, like, feel like you've really accomplished something. Um, it's also, I have heard a lot that these kinds of puddle, puzzles, like, sort of keep your brain young. Right, and that's yeah. why a lot of people do them. Yeah, I, I, I've seen research to that effect that um, that, that your brain is like a muscle, and uh, you know you get, you get stronger with use. Um, uh, I hope that's true because I spend lots of time doing puzzles like this. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I would find that a little gratifying. Uh, yeah, um, but uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so we got some questions coming in. Let's see. Um, so let's see. Coeur d'Alene, I think, is how you say that name, um, is asking. Can you recommend any good contemporary mystery novels that make use of good logic? Yeah, that's a that's a good question um, because most of the authors I, I you know I have in mind this is a lot of this literature starting with Sherlock Holmes in the late eighteen hundreds uh, and then Agatha Christie was like nineteen hundreds uh, you know early nineteen hundreds um, so yeah a lot of mystery stories nowadays don't don't put as much emphasis on logic uh, you know as they used to uh, but among contemporary authors uh, the, my my personal favorite uh, is a Japanese author uh, named uh, Keigo Hikashino. Uh, uh, I might even be able to spell it. It's uh, no, K E I G O, Kego uh, Higashino, uh, H I G A S H I N O. Uh, that's, that's pretty close. It's not exactly right. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you know, a, a lot of his novels are now being translated into English. And uh, I, I think he's, he's very inventive and very clever. I know, I know he's a huge bestseller in Japan, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's relatively recent that his, uh, his works are available in good English um, uh, translations. Uh, two in particular, he wrote one called uh, Salvation of a Saint. Um, uh, yeah, Salvation of a Saint, I think it was, and uh, The Devotion of Suspect X, I think was another one of his. Um, and he, he, he's wonderfully inventive 
Uh, his, his detective character is called uh, uh, Professor Galileo. He's a physics professor at a university. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, that's that's an author that the, the person could try. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, Matt is asking, how often do these authors who present logic puzzles present an unsolvable or over-constrained problem? Do they ever? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I, let, let's say, uh, you know, if, um, if people like Smolian or Carroll or, or, or me, you know, in the book, um, uh, that, that would be considered kind of a deficient puzzle. Like there's a certain artistry uh, to constructing the puzzle. So like in a logic puzzle, you don't want to have, you know, extraneous information. In other words, there shouldn't be premise, you know, there shouldn't be statements made uh, that, that you don't need to solve the puzzle. At the same time, if it's under constrained, then, then it's not really fair to the reader, right? I mean, you know, there's, there, there should be uh, one solution. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of artistry that goes into this. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, a, you know, a certain aesthetic you know, element to what makes a good puzzle. And, uh, and I think that's just, you know, uh, like, like with Lewis Carroll is maybe a good illustration of that. Um, you know, because, you know, if, you know, I, I could very easily give you a syllogism like, uh, you know, uh, no A's or B's, uh, you know, some A's or not B. And, uh, you know, or, uh, or excuse me, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I know that was a bad one. <laughs> some A's or B's, uh, you know, no, no A's or not B's or something like that. And you would say, oh, that would just be a textbook exercise. But when you read Carroll's books where he uses these very funny uh, and, uh, you, know, you know, very absurd statements, suddenly it's a fun and interesting puzzle. And, uh, you yeah, that, know, that's another thing I, I, I get into in the book that, uh, you know, when is it a puzzle and when is it a problem? <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, you know, Raymond Smullyan in one of his books, he commented that you could take all of Euclid's elements and, and just rewrite it uh, as a puzzle book. Right. You know, instead of writing it as a textbook, I mean, you know, Euclid does, you know, it's all this you know, theorem proof, very technical, uh, you know, uh, detail. But you could just recreate it as a, you know, as a as a, as a puzzle book uh, and make it much make it for much more engaging reading. So, yeah, it's a little bit. I, I, as I recall, I even have a section in the book that's specifically discussing when is it a puzzle? And when is it a problem? So I, I hope I hope that addresses what the, the, um, the, the person had in mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the Lewis Carroll example is almost like creates a story too. So it seems like it could, you know. Yeah. A... Yeah. You can, I, I mentioned these puzzles where he has like 40 and 50 premises. You, you can read them and just enjoy them as something to read, you know, <laughs> you know, even if you have no intention of trying to solve the puzzle. Um, um, Amy has a good question that I would like to know. Can you improve your ability to follow logic? Can you, can you become oh, yeah. better at it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, um, uh, I, I think it's like any other skill. Uh, like, I, I mean, I know, um, I mean, just in my own life, I mean, when I first started getting interested, you know, like middle school and high school, um, I, I never thought I had any particular talent for this, to be honest. Uh, I just really enjoyed it and I was willing to work really hard at it. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's like any other skill. You, 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 know, you can certainly get much better at it with just a little bit of practice, a little bit of experience. Um, uh, if you have a little professional guidance, that can help too. Um, but uh, so, so yeah, and, and you know, that, that's kind of how I view mathematics in general. You know, people have this idea that, uh, you know, you have to be some sort of weird genius, you know, to do mathematics. Well, I, I certainly don't see myself that way because, uh, you know, I, I, you know, mathematics is not something that comes especially easily to me for whatever reason is I, I, I really enjoyed it. And because I enjoyed it, I was willing to work very hard at it. Uh, but I, I certainly spend my fair share of time in college classes and then in graduate school feeling like the dummy in the room. Um, but I stuck with it. Uh, because it's okay to feel like the dummy once in a while, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, if it's leading you somewhere. So, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, a facility for logical reasoning uh, is, uh, you know, it's like any other skill, uh, you know, with, with, with practice, you can get better at it. Uh, I don't, I don't know that you're going to take, you know, a uh, you know, normal person and turn them into Isaac Newton, right? I mean, you know, there are, you know, just people who are just ferociously talented at this. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, but, you know, it's like anything else. Like, I mean, you know, anyone who's willing to train and practice can become a very decent basketball player. Uh, but you're not going to turn him into LeBron James, you know. And um, uh, so I think logic is the same way. Uh, and, and I would mention, like, the puzzles I included here, um, uh, I was trying to keep them somewhat elementary. Uh, they, they get much more complicated, you know, uh, you know as you go along. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, anyway, that's, that's how I would answer that. Yeah, that's, that's encouraging. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Kent is asking... Is there a genre of logic or logic puzzles that includes just st st statistical or probabilistic thought? Uh, that, that is a very good question. Um, certainly not among the authors that I describe in the book. Um, statistical puzzles, though, uh, I, you know, I, I, you know, now that you ask that question, I, I, I can't say that you know, uh, I, I've really seen that many. Certainly uh, puzzles and probability are a very common thing. Uh, and there are a lot of connections between probability and logic. I mentioned George Boole very, uh, very briefly uh, in there uh, in his big book, uh, The Laws of Thought, where he, he presents uh, you know, the, you know, the, some of the basic principles of mathematical logic. He has several chapters on probability theory. 
So probability puzzles are, are they're, they're kind of a dime a dozen. Like, I'll bet you can just go to Amazon and type in your know, probability puzzles uh, you know, and, and find uh, many books of those. Um, uh, but, but, that, but that's a little different from, from what I have in mind you know, for the book. Because if you're introducing notions of chance, uh, probability or statistics, um, then, then you're not really talking about pure logic anymore. Right now, now you're talking about reasoning you know, with the presence of uncertainty, uh, you know, and things like that. And that's a fascinating subject in its own right. Uh, and I can certainly recommend many interesting books in probability. Um, but uh, that's not anything I discuss in this book. And, and, and I would consider that kind of just a different genre uh, you know, of, of puzzles. Uh, maybe that'll be the next book. We'll, uh, we'll do that. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I'm sorry, I come to think of it. I, I can't believe I overlooked this one. Uh, but there are, there are puzzles like the Monty Hall problem. Uh, uh, and I, 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 yeah, one of my earlier books was the Monty Hall problem, but it's an interesting example, right? Because um, uh, people sometimes describe it as a logical paradox, which it really isn't. Uh, it's just a very counterintuitive problem in probability. Um, but it is maybe a nice example of, a, of maybe the synthesis between probability and logic. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't believe the Monty Hall problem slipped my mind, but uh, um, but that might be an example that the the, the uh, question would find interesting. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Somebody wrote, somebody wrote in, uh, I think she's just being a little funny. Estrella said, um, is your sweater some kind of code? It looks like it has like some um, uh, dots on it. <laughs> no, it's just that, that as far as I know. It's just, uh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, the cleanest sweater I had. So I yeah. <laughs> um, and Matt is asking again, um, how many logics are there? Smiley face. Okay, well, that's, that's a very good question. Um, certainly, if you talk about like different systems of logic that philosophers have floated, uh, quite a few <laughs> is the answer. Um, uh, you know, you, you can find books, you know, big, you know, you know, textbooks now, uh, with titles like introduction to non-classical logics and, uh, just chapter by chapter, they'll, they'll, uh, describe different systems of logic. And what they're doing there is that, um, you know, you know, logic is supposed to capture, uh, certain aspects of language, I guess is the way to put it. And, um, uh, you know, so for example, you know, um, you know, you might have, uh, well, uh, how should I put this? Um, so like, uh, you know, um, like, like, like what, you know, so, so the kind of logic that everyone thinks of, if you just say, hey, let's do logic, right? They, you know, they're probably going to think of so-called classical logic. That's the kind of logic we teach in math classes, right? And that's the kind of logic the mathematicians use. And most people would say that that's just what logic is, right? And you have principles like the law of non-contradiction, you know, A and not A, you know, cannot be true in the same sense at the same time. Right, you know, um, and uh, and then like the law of the excluded middle, which I mentioned very briefly, uh, which is basically uh, you know, you know uh, of a statement and its negation, you know, at least one of them is true, um, and you know, you have these basic principles, right? You know, every statement is either true or false. There's no intermediate truth value. Uh, these are sort of bedrock principles of classical logic. Non-classical logic is when you challenge one or more of these principles. So there are, for example, multi-valued logics where you might have uh, you know you know you know statements could be true, false, or neutral. Uh, and in principle, you could have four-valued logic and five-valued logic. Um, you could also have, you know, infinitely many truth values. This is known as fuzzy logic. Uh, in other words, where you, you you take the view that truth and falsity are not, uh, you know, all or nothing things, right? That that, that there's a uh, there's a gradation, there's a degree of truth, and uh, and you you can kind of see, you know, that that could be reasonable in certain contexts. Maybe you don't want to talk in absolutes about something being true or false. So you can kind of see where, you know, you know, at least in principle, where something like that could be useful. Um, there are there are systems of logic where you try to capture more of the language. Uh, you know, so for example, um, uh, this is maybe getting a little bit into the weeds, but you know, uh, mathematically we talk about if then statements, uh, and we usually say, um, uh, you know, an if then statement is true if the first part is. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, we say, um, uh, um, you know, sorry, a, a an if then statement is false if the first part is true and the second part is false. Uh, but true in any other circumstance. Like if I say, if it rains, then I'll go to the movies and it rains and I don't go to the movies, right? Then I, then I lied to you, right? I said something false. Um, but, but, but generally we consider such a statement to be true in any other circumstance. And there, and there are good practical reasons why we do this, but it has weird consequences, right? Uh, you know, so for example, um, you, know, I, you, know, you know, if I say something like, if two plus two equals five, then Santa Claus exists, okay? That's a true statement according to classical logic. Uh, and even you can also say something like, uh, if I am not a cat, then I am not a dog, right? Well, I'm not a cat and I'm not a dog, right? So both parts of this statement is true. So classical logic says that statement is true, okay? It doesn't feel true, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not a cat, then I'm not a dog. So you have systems of logic called relevance logics, where you try to put in a relevance condition that the first part and the second part have to be relevant to each other. Uh, you have systems of logic where you have notions of time involved, uh, so-called temporal logics. Um, you know, uh, classical logic isn't like that. You can have what's so-called a modal logic, uh, where you try to incorporate notions like maybe a statement is necessarily true, like two plus two equals four, 
And maybe a statement is only contingently true, like I will go to the park tomorrow. Uh, and maybe you want to capture that in your system of logic. So that's kind of what I'm saying, that there, there, there are all these different nuances to language and to reasoning. And you have to decide if you want your system of language, uh, system of logic to incorporate those things. So, yeah. So if you ask about like how many systems of logic are there out there, there's uh, quite a lot. And some of them are pretty bizarre. OK, uh, you know, there's a, uh, you know, no idea is so bizarre that some philosopher has not floated it uh, you know, seriously. And you do not want to argue with them about it because they will win the argument. <laughs> They're better at arguing than you are. I know I tried. <laughs> Well, this has been really fun. And I will say as a person who um, did my darndest, I hope this doesn't break your heart, to get out of math in college. Um, I I the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I took enough science that they let me not. Um, but anyhow, this has been really fun. So thank you so much for this presentation. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone who, who came. Yeah, yeah. I want to thank the audience for um, for watching tonight. Um, if you are interested in buying a copy of Jason's book, please uh, use the link on the screen and that'll take you right over to our local bookseller, Third Place Books. Um, and if you want to see more Town Hall content, you can follow this Crowdcast channel or uh, look up our calendar online at townhallseattle.org. Um, Jason, I hope that uh, we get to see you in the future that you can come visit Seattle. Um, but uh, it was great to have you tonight and uh, I hope that you have a great night.